let's move uh, uh, from super high-tech China to what might be seen as quite an old industry, which is <laughs> European, well, global steel. And Gisbert, you run Klockner Steel, and you, but you have gone through an incredibly bold business model transformation. Could you tell us a bit about it? And what was the, tr well, maybe tell us about the business. What was the trigger for this transformation? And then what have you done? Yeah, we, we are um, a global uh, steel and metals distribution and service center company. And uh, in our, indus our industry is typically very fragmented. So we have a lot of smaller players, only some big, but a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, smaller players. In the industry, we, we have uh, everywhere, nearly everywhere, overcapacity. So that was one situation uh, which uh, made a change uh, necessary because this, industries, this industry is not really consolidating. And it's not consolidating because uh, scale, even for a bigger player in this business, is limited. Scale, for instance, uh, through better purchasing conditions when we're buying steel from the big steel producers on the one side. But on the other side, all the smaller players have much uh, less uh, complexity costs. And this is why a reason why this uh, market is not really consolidated. And, uh, consolidating. and then the second issue was, I thought it was about four years ago when we started this digital transformation. The second issue was, so our initial core business is, uh, is, is stockholding. And in our, our industry is typically very intransparent. There is no real transparency about demand, about supply, about um, uh, prices. And because of this, a lot of steel is moved around and a lot of steel is stocked. And this is, uh, was, is, is, uh, was initially our core business. So our core business uh, exists, if you like, to a certain ex extent because of this inefficiency in the market. And we saw it about four years ago that we don't want to wait until uh, uh, someone comes from the Silicon Valley maybe with a good idea uh, how, to, how to change this market with a platform and then we started uh, to innovate uh, by ourselves. And can you tell us about that innovation? Because you've done it in a quite an interesting way. I, th I believe you created a sort of platform for yourself and your core business and you've also created an open platform which has a, some aspects of competition and cannibalization, doesn't it? Yeah, we start, so we had from the beginning uh, this idea of a platform, so already more than uh, four years ago, um, but uh, we started uh, small. Yeah? So we started with, uh, in Berlin, by the way, so in a separate setup, in a, in a digital hub uh, here in Berlin, and uh, uh, there we uh, developed the first tools uh, um, uh, for the corporate business and also towards our customers. By the way, this was in the beginning a very independent uh, hub here in Berlin, but then we learned uh, that we have to move it somewhat closer to the corporate uh, to leverage on the one side the assets we have on the corporate side, so customers, uh, uh, know-how and, and uh, suppliers, and also uh, to increase acceptance on the corporate side. Now, because the problem was then we developed the first tools, and uh, then we had to convince, uh, for instance, our uh, salespeople to use this platform. But, but, but when they are not convinced, when they fear uh, that uh, digitalization, that with digitalization, uh, that they will lose their job, for instance, then they will also convince not uh, the purchasing uh, guy on the other side. So we moved it a bit closer uh, to, uh, uh, to Klöckner itself. Uh, then uh, we developed, further developed this proprietary platform. We also opened this platform as a marketplace, but only for complementary products. And then the next stage, the idea was in the beginning then to open it also for uh, competitors. Mm. Yeah? But uh, this, on the other, on, on, on the other hand, is, 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 is then starting to be disruptive. And this is very difficult to communicate into the company. Mm. So they understand this marketplace and they understand that it makes sense to go online and that we with this have more time for the customer and so on and so on. But, uh, but, but to convince people that... The, the fiercest competitors are all of a sudden customers of, of a platform uh, that doesn't work. And then, uh, then we decided uh, uh, some time ago to set up a second venture here in Berlin, and this is called uh, XOM uh, Materials, Oxom Materials. And this, uh, this platform is completely, uh, uh, so legally uh, Klockner owns it, but other than that, it's completely independent from Klockner. And uh, uh, so with their own management, uh, and, 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 they and, and, and uh, we also want to make sure that this platform is also legally getting independent over the next two years. So we're selling, we're now starting to sell 
also uh, um, uh, participation into this uh, platform, also to competitors, uh, also to competitors. But this platform is then also competing uh, against our own marketplace already. You know? So I would say the difference is a bit our own marketplace is, is, is more vertical, finally, more specialized on the Klockner business, whereas the platform is more general. But a lot of our business is commodity business, and here maybe uh, uh, the, the general platform will finally uh, succeed, uh, succeed. It's really interesting that all three examples of your, your, of your businesses, you've all taken you know, Steve Jobs' quote we mentioned before, skating to where the puck is going to be rather than where it is now. And you know, Naspers did that in you know, big steps, big bold steps in investing in OLX and other businesses. And we've just heard from Jonathan, incredible skate of, <laughs> skating to where the puck's going. And you, and, but even you know, a, a old world business, I mean, you've, that's a, you've, the puck is quite a long way off and you've, and you've, you've skated right there, which, which is very bold. Did you have challenges explaining to your shareholders about this? Uh, yeah, we had challenges all the time, by the way. And uh, because uh, as you might, uh, our shareholders, as you might guess, are uh, so they bought our they buying our shares because we are a steel company. Mm. And 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 when we started then this digital uh, digital transformation, um, uh, they were at least reluctant, I would I would say, uh, to a certain extent in the beginning. E even also the supervisory board is also not right from the beginning. Uh, um, uh, too positive, yes. I would say. They, they supported all the time, but they were also, uh, to a certain extent, uh, reluctant. But meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, that's, this has completely. By the way, also in the, within the industry, in the in industry, they probably saw it two or three years ago that this guy is somewhat crazy, uh, <laughs> discussing all, all the time digitalization and, 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 and not steel. No? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but that, that has changed meanwhile. And well, what we're seeing is clearly, we have not, we have not reached the, uh, the inflection point yet, but we as Klockner, for instance, doing currently 23% uh, of our business is already online business. So this is much more than in, in uh, other industries and, uh, and also more than our competitors. And, uh, uh, but but uh, also in, in other traditional industries we are seeing, if it's chemi chemicals or so on. So the, the interest concerning platforms and what, uh, what, what this means going forward is, is no doubt about is uh, clearly increasing. That's fantastic. I had a question. We had some questions from you. So if anybody wants to add any others, but there was a, I've got one for um, actually for Martin first. Um, in terms of how uh, the benefits of being part of the NASPA's broader community, uh, you mentioned no interference. I mean, do you get is it is it positive interference if you like or support or how does it? Are, are there good synergies by being part of that bigger group? Yes, absolutely. As I said, um, uh, one of the last slides, uh, uh, being part of NASPERS has really helped us to, um, to do what we needed to do, because to build a platform business, uh, one not only needs the right ideas and the right team, but also um, yeah, one needs to make a big bet on, uh, on, on, uh, on the opportunity. And that means providing the cash to, um, to, to invest to promote platforms, but also the patience and the stamina to see this through to the end. Mm. Uh, which is probably much more difficult for things like uh, like let go, uh, which uh, are very very expensive uh, for a few years. Uh, they're much more difficult to do as a public company. Mm. So being part of Naspers with uh, uh, that is not run by the quarter but by by the decade mm. has really helped us to do what we needed to do. Mm. And then in addition, there are important synergies around um, uh, sharing information with other Naspers companies. Yeah. So uh, I think it's really, we couldn't have done this uh, on our own. I mean, well, 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 both, both of you and, and Jonathan's examples are, you're, you're taking on board what, you're doing it naturally, but, but Jeff, Bezos, Be Jeff Bezos always says it takes five to seven years for um, a new type of business model to have an economic impact on the company. And most, I guess a lot of companies are driven by short-term requirements. I mean, with you, Gisbert, was that, I mean, trying to, trying to get that, uh, if, if you like, be allowed to take that long-term bet, how challenging was that? Uh, yeah, that is uh, one of the biggest challenges as a public company. You know? So indeed, our investors are more short-term oriented, and they are not really digital oriented in our digital business. And, uh, and, and so this is this ambidextra uh, uh, leadership. You know? So you, on the one side, you have, of course, to make sure that uh, the core business is uh, doing at least quite well and, and also improving. And 
I, I, I would say only this gives you the freedom on the other side mm. to uh, develop also this new business because the investments are uh, significant mm. in this, in this uh, new business. And, uh, and, but whenever we would have get a problem, got a problem on the, on the, in the core business, then we would have also had difficulties to develop this new business because the, the, uh, also shareholders, are, they are not that radical. So they don't uh, expect from us as a steel company uh, a radical change. Mm. Now, as, as mentioned, they are probably even a bit more reluctant than uh, when the change is too radical. Uh, also, this is changing now, step by step, but it, it, takes, it takes, in such a traditional industry, it takes some time. Yeah. And did, you, did you reallocate quite a bit of capital when you saw this opportunity to say, well, we normally invest this amount, we've got to take quite a big part of that pie and put it over here? Was it was it a sizable amount or was it a small amount to start with and building up? Or? Yeah, it was a small amount in the beginning because we started really, we, we, we thought big, but we really started small. You know? So, uh, and, and because we also first had, had to learn how, how to develop a platform like this differently than we are typically used to develop it uh, in, in a corporate. So not the waterfall model, which takes time, which okay. takes a lot of resources. So we started really uh, uh, with this MVPs, very small, very customer concentric, and then we built it up. Mm. And, and, and with this, we were always able to show already some quick wins and some success during this journey. And, and, and with this, we were also able to spend year, year on year more into these new developments. Did it help? I, couldn't, I think you, were you the finance director or the CFO originally beforehand? Before uh, yeah, yeah. I, and for some time, yeah. I was uh, both. You were both. Yeah, and both. Does that help, do you think? Because, being the, yeah. because often the CFO is the barrier to a lot of these sort of big ideas. But does that help that yeah, you were yeah, both? Yeah, that helped. But, but uh, we, 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 by the way, we had in the beginning two. two uh, so we had Kluckner.i as a hub, it's a digital hub, yeah. and then we had uh, Kluckner Ventures. Right. And uh, my CFO was always complaining when I had a new venture no, where okay. I wanted to invest in. And then I switched it. As, uh, uh, and now he's the CEO of this venture company, and I can't ah, <laughs> okay. Well, let me bring in Jonathan. There's a question somebody asked, a really good question, actually, which I, I get asked a lot when I share your case study with people, is how transferable is what you've done in, with Ping An to Europe, because oh, those lax privacy laws in China and uh, sort of big markets and so on. Fundamentally, I mean, it, could you take a similar model and bring it to Europe if you had that vision and, and, and guts? Um, I don't see why not uh, in principle. I think that, just let me address the privacy issue firstly. I think that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding of privacy in China, and I think there's probably even greater misunderstanding of privacy in the West. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, we take privacy pretty seriously as a company, and we don't do anything without permission from customers. Um, Interestingly, in China, there's a, um, an ordinance that came out, I think it's March this year, February this year. If you read it, it's extremely similar to the principles that underpin GDPR and the, the European landscape in general. Uh, what China doesn't want to do is to be too far out of step from the rest of the world in areas like financial regulation, in privacy, and so forth. Um, that will not be helpful for it in the long term. I think the China landscape's a bit different. I think the technology transformation that's been delivered in China is so palpable, it's so far-reaching uh, in people's lives that I think there's probably, uh, I think Chinese people are probably more trusting with their information than they might be elsewhere. Mm. Uh, and so far, that trust hasn't really been abused. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, how the state uses data is an entirely different question, um, and that applies in every state, by the way. Um, I think in the West, you know, probably people don't really understand, you know, uh, it was probably a re revelation to most people when Mark Zuckerberg sitting in the US Senate inquiry and explaining that, um, you know, Facebook knows, ev if, you, if your Facebook subscribers, Facebook knows everybody is in this room right now, for example, or Google does if you've allowed Google to track your location. Um, if you have a Torch app on your phone, are you really aware that you, when you said that they're, they're, you're willing to let them know your location, they're really sucking out everything in your phone all the time, and you've permissioned them to do that? So I, th I think this data question is a much more complicated question. I think GDPR is a, a, an attempt to sort of get at that. I think it's a pretty uh, inadequate attempt so far. And I think the problem becomes much bigger as more and more data sources become available. So, so I think that's, you know, I, I don't think data is really fundamentally different between the China market and elsewhere, and I don't see anything that in, in the models that is not really replicable. Yeah, so so I mean, it's interesting because Allianz and AXA used to be more valuable than 
than Ping An, you're significantly more valuable than them. And I believe uh, HSBC, which is Europe's biggest bank, used to own 15%, I think, of Ping An. Then, because of the crisis, it, I think, sold that stake to recoup some money, look after its core business model. And your, I think, Ping An, is, when I last looked, is more valuable than HSBC, and I think you've bought a stake in HSBC. Yeah, we're the largest shareholder in HSBC. Oh, we, so, we the, so I, you know, like the dividend. Focusing on your core business model, or inventing the new, maybe there's some lessons to learn about uh, that boldness. Um, so I, uh, there's a good actually question for you, Martin, as well, um, about B2B, because I think mainly what you showed is B2C, I believe, isn't it? So, or C to C, isn't it? So uh, do you, can, can your model also apply to B2B increasingly, or is it much different? Um, yeah, so our origins are in C to C. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and once you have ma amassed that audience, it's quite easy to sell it to B2C, mm. uh, because the moment you're on OLX or on a veto every month, that's also the month in which you want to buy a new car. So to then display ads from car dealers is a natural <laughs> extension. That's how we move to B2C. Mm. I think B2B is, uh, is a new territory for us, but we've started by uh, creating an, um, a platform for heavy machinery, so tractors. Okay diggers, oh, yes. trains, uh, in the construction and transportation areas. Um, but but what, what we need to see is, is uh, these are invariably platforms with fewer, uh, let's say, uh, buyers and sellers. But we then see the same network effect kick in at some point. Okay, great. Uh, good. We're going to have a poll before we go to lunch. So as ever, if you, use the if you have the Slido tool, and it, this is all about... Um, commitment. I think, Martin, you mentioned commitment, didn't you? Commitment to business models, um, skating to where the puck's going, um, and looking ahead five years. So, so investing in the long term, not just the short term. And the question is this. Um, it'll come up in a second. I think this is the question here. Um, I'm going to ask you, over the next five years, here we go, um, how should your company reallocate or allocate its resources to compete more effectively in the digital economy? And I'll just give you one stat before you vote. Uh, I looked at some analysis recently that said that in 10 years' time, about 30% of total economic activity in the world will be mediated by platforms and ecosystems. 30% of, of economic activity could be mediated by platforms and ecosystems. Today, it's about 5%. A lot of it over some of the businesses that we've, taught, we've, we've heard from today. So 30%, that's about $60 trillion of, um, of uh, business being done through platforms in 10 years' time. So for you, running your businesses or, or going back to your bosses to talk to your bosses about it, how do you think um, your company needs to uh, think differently about allocating uh, its resources over over the next five years, not immediately, over the next five years. So if you could place your vote, just choose one of those uh, things there, and then we'll see, and I will ask the panel for a quick uh, comment on that, and then, oh, it's lunchtime, that's, which, is, which is wonderful, because I'm sort of starting to get a bit tired, I have to say. So we're gonna have, uh, let's just see the results, so just another 10 seconds left. So, and by the way, all, all the questions that you've asked will capture those, and if we haven't answered them during the course of the two, two or three days, we'll come back to you in our report and try and answer those. But, but here we go, okay. So next five years. Um, okay, well, interesting is the, the, the second from bottom, because that's really what everybody does today, I would say. 95% on the core, rest on new business models. So this audience is saying that's not the best approach, although today, that is exactly what happens. And uh, you have said, uh, oh, interesting, 50 to 75% of the core, uh, 25 to 50% on new business models. I guess that's sort of probably what we've seen from, certainly from NASPERS, you know, probably something similar, maybe for Ping An. Um, maybe that's probably what you did five years ago. And I don't know, how would that relate to Klockner, do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, in the next five years, I would say we probably will be able to do more than 50%. Okay. I personally would be more radical. I, okay. would, I would be go above 75%. Wow, wow. So this is, this is CEO and CFO and CDO. You're the digital officer as well. So he's <laughs> um, of a very traditional German, not, not Chinese, German uh, company who's saying more than 
we will, yeah, this is what we will do. I would be personally, if I would, uh, if I would be more radical. Uh, more radical. I would, I would put more than 75% uh, in you'd be 20, You'd be down the, the last one at the bottom. Uh. Okay. Fantastic. Well, could we say thank you to the panelists for a fan, for fantastic <laughs> stimulus today? Thank you so much. Yeah.